Okay, so um, everybody hit mute and we're gonna hold our questions till the end and we'll have Q and A for about 20 minutes when Zane is finished. I'm gonna do a little intro and I met Zane while I was getting my cameras cleaned at Seawood. And I think I asked Carl who might have some interesting work to show. And I was told about this guy named Zane and told he does these vintage looking prints. And I thought that was a great uh, person to have in our group because I have not been in a dark room for 15, 20 years. And I have never even heard of this type of print. And so I think tonight's gonna be very interesting and different than our normal speakers. Zane Allen is a photographer based in Northern California, specializing in the historical process of wet plate collodion. And with over 20 years experience in the photo industry, Zane sought something unique. He found himself drawn to the tangibility quality and temporal ambiguity of the process and made it his niche with the 175 year old method. Currently Zane operates from a studio located in the historic camera store and museum Seawood Photo. He is available for a range of services, including studio portraits, location assignments and pop-ups and commission work. So I am gonna hand the floor over to Zane. Thank you, Stephanie. Hello, uh, Fairfax Photo Club. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining. Um, can I make my screen big? How do I do that? Um, Have you shared your screen yet? Or not yet. I will. Um, the green button on the bottom. Yeah, cool. Um, I'll do that when I go to actually present my slideshow um, right now. Uh, like Stephanie said, I manage a great camera store in San Rafael. Uh, that's my full-time 40 hour plus a week gig. Uh, I've been pursuing wet plate collodion. Uh, most people probably know it as uh, tintypes. Uh, if anybody's familiar with tintypes that you see from Civil War era, um, it's a, I, I like to think of it as the second great photographic process. Um, the first being the daguerreotype which is similar in a lot of respects, a lot more difficult and a lot harder and a lot more dangerous. Uh, the daguerreotype was an expensive process where the image was actually captured on a polished piece of silver using different chemical vapors, including the developing stage, which was mercury vapor. As we know, mercury is not good to handle or inhale, so it was very dangerous. Um, somewhere around 1850, a little bit earlier, they started uh, developing the process that I use called wet plate collodion. Um, it replaced the mercury vapor and the other chemical vapors with uh, collodion, a rigid collodion, which is basically an emulsion made from cotton soaked down into ether and alcohol till it's liquid. That emulsion gets a couple salts in it. Um, it's then flowed onto a piece of metal, hence a tintype, or a piece of glass, which was patented by a guy named Ambro and became known as the Ambro type. I'll show you a couple of videos of me flowing a plate. So the emulsion gets poured on, the plate gets soaked into a bath of silver nitrate, which stains your hands black if you get it on your skin. So almost all wet plate photographers will have these black marks on their hands. They stick around for a week and go away. It doesn't really cause any harm. Um, the plate will get sensitized for roughly three minutes or so in silver, comes out dripping wet. We wipe off the back. It's loaded into an old camera, a wooden camera, really any kind of camera, but most commonly something like this that's period correct. This is a big 11 by 14 camera. Um, I've used this to make just about every image that you guys are gonna see tonight. Um, a couple of the images towards the end, and I'm gonna show you in person too, we're made with an even bigger camera, a 20 inch camera. Um, after the film is loaded into the camera, a uh, dark slide is pulled, it's exposed to light. Uh, I shoot a lot with strobes here in the studio at Seawood, um, really powerful strobes, uh, as powerful as the sun basically. Uh, that makes me able to capture instantaneous photos. So you're gonna see pictures of uh, dogs, animals, pets, uh, babies. 
this wasn't typically done uh, in the 1800s because they didn't have access to these high power strobes. Um, if I was shooting on a bright day out in the sun, uh, exposure times are going to be, you know, two to four to five seconds. So that's why you see a lot of these older pictures, older tintypes and stuff where the people are standing real still. Even then they're kind of blurry. Uh, there's the whole hidden mother portraits where they would put a shroud over uh, one of the parents and they would hold the infant and try to hide. Those are very collectible tintypes if you can find those and pretty obscure. Um, so I capture my images with strobes. Uh, basically, I'll, and you'll see videos of this. I'll take the lens cap off the camera, give them a little countdown, three, two, one, hit them with some lights. Uh, light photons hits the chemicals right on the piece of glass or metal. I take that back into a dark room, develop it, fix it, and that becomes the object. So really everything I'm showing you tonight, uh, it, it's less than ideal to view on a screen. Um, and that's why I often advertise with little videos that you'll see that I share on Instagram and other places, because uh, these things, I have one right here, um, this little picture of a flower that I made, um, they exist as photo objects. So unlike a print or anything, they're one of one. Um, this plate always exists in the same space as the person or the object that it was made in. Um, the last hundreds of years when they're done right, there's ones from the very beginning that still look like new. Um, so they're very archival. That's uh, some of the specialness of this process is it's about as analog as you get. You know, you, you prepare each aspect of the film and pour it over the, the metal plate or glass and then preserve it uh, and it lasts a long time. Um, if anybody ever wants to see these in person and you're local to our area, come into Seawood. Uh, I'm filming all this uh, right now from the studio where I shoot most of these. I have a whole shelf of these. All the staff here uh, has to sit for a tintype with me when they, when they get hired. Um, we, they're all on display. Uh, I really recommend coming in, getting them on your hands and uh, checking them out. Um, so that kind of gives you a, a rough, real quick overview of the process. Uh, it's very labor intensive. There's tons of steps, tons of maintenance, tons of cleaning involved, um, too much for me to really get into. There's lots of great uh, information out there. Uh, anybody can reach out to me if you wanna know more about the actual process and I can point you in the right directions to books and instructors and teachers. Uh, I taught all this stuff myself um, you know, over the course of the last 10 years uh, with some help from people online and, and books. Um, so that kind of gives you a, a real rough overview of the process. So you sort of know what I'm sharing and looking at. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and kind of start my slideshow. Um, so what you're seeing here, this is one of my first uh, clear glass ambro types I made. And this is a still life that I set up uh, in my apartment in Petaluma. Uh, I had a tiny little studio that I lived in and also shot photos in when I was figuring all this stuff out. This is a 10 inch clear glass ambrotype. Uh, I actually had this on display in the Image Flows uh, last group show, their alternative process show. If anybody went down there, um, basically clear glass. Uh, I framed the whole thing. It's a, a little mirror that I rigged up to balance on its edge, lit with window light. Uh, attach this uh, very cool sphinx or death head moth onto here just to practice and learn the process and also make an image. Um, I'm pretty proud of this one. It's all framed up right now, so I can't really show it to you in person. Um, I'll show you some other examples of clear glass amber types because they're, they're a unique uh, form of photography. Um, here's a couple little videos just uh, showing you the process a little bit. So this is the pour that I demonstrated. Uh, it's kind of the first step in it. Um, this is actually a pouring the emulsion onto the piece of a uh, tin or aluminum is what we mostly use these days. Um, so basically I'll use this trophy aluminum. It's what 90% of people do in the process are using. Uh, it comes protected, so it's dust free. That's the emulsion. Uh, it gets poured onto there. I always spill when people are filming. I swear I do it nice and without spills when nobody's watching. 
uh, I rock it like this to get any ridges out. Um, I'm trying to create as smooth of a surface as possible. So this looks real nice. Uh, the better I do this step, the better the whole image looks because that is my film. That's where the image will be captured. Um, after I flow the plate and it soaks in the silver for a minute, I load it into the camera just like this. Uh, I'll pull the dark side out with the lens cap on, pull the lens cap, give a countdown, flash the lights, and that's it. That exposes it to light real quick, uh, locks the image in. I then take it back into a dark room and where I pour developer over the plate, bring it back out into the light, and then we fix it. The image disappears and comes back right in front of the, my customer's eyes. It's always a little bit of that analog photo magic that's great to share. Um, now I'm gonna kind of show you some more just of the work. Uh, these are some of the first uh, tintypes I ever made. Um, I believe this is my third tintype that I ever made. And this is probably around the 10th or 11th. Um, as you can see, there's tons of flaws. Uh, people always appreciate the flaws in these things. Uh, that's one of the beauties of the process is everything has to be done while it's fluid and wet. It's very physical. Uh, the developer gets thrown on the plate, literally and washed around and the whole development process happens in 12 seconds that I count off in my head. Um, temperature, the age of the chemistry, the humidity in the air, all will affect the outcome. Um, so there's a lot of little variables that you have to judge, juggle. Um, it's very easy to drop a plate or uh, mishandle it. Uh, and all that stuff creates all these kind of wonderful defects. Um, I've worked really hard to get as close to perfecting the process as I can. Uh, they're still never perfect. And it's great and so rewarding when it works. And then something will happen and it will just stop. <laughs> It'll stop working and it can be a struggle. And I wonder why I'm doing any of this. But when they come out great, they come out great. Um, Um, this is more what I do now. Um, as you can see, it's a lot cleaner. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite images I will ever make. Uh, this is some close friends. Uh, their child here was less than a year old. Um, again, using strobes, I can now capture images like this. A uh, little baby Mia poked her head up at the right time and lifted her arm and it all worked out perfectly. Uh, these are the ones I'm really happy with, you know. Uh, they bring her in every year now and they get a new photo and they sit on a mantle. And it's great to have these things displayed <laughs> as objects out there in the world. Um, like I was saying, these are objects. So they're not, you know, I scan these uh, using a flatbed scanner and I can digitize them and I can make prints from them. But the core of these are a physical object. So I make these videos a lot to advertise these things. Um, they never look as good on a screen. Uh, this is showing the physical plate. Uh, these are what I share online and on Instagram when I get good ones I'm happy with just to show people what they really are. They reflect light differently. Um, they need direct light on them to really kind of shine. It's just silver sitting on metal or glass. Um, people ask all the time, who wants these things? You know, people come in and uh, the, the you know, a lot of people that I, that come and sit for me have never had a professional picture done or a professional studio portrait done. Um, they wonder who comes in, does these things, couples, families, uh, young people, old people, a lot of people interested in the history of photography. And, you know, a lot of the same people that work with their hands and listen to vinyl. Um, I shoot a lot of these couples. Uh, I love all the different looks of people. Uh, I always recommend people bring in props, whether it's children, objects that are close to them, furry companions. Uh, if I can ever make a portrait that feels right and I think tells a story about who somebody is or just depicts a little bit more, I'm happy. Um, I love this one where Jason recedes back to the back a little bit and it's kind of mysterious. His partner comes forward uh, they both have their bunny that they cherish in front of them. 
uh, anything that tells a bit of a story and I can get the lighting to communicate uh, aspect of the person and I'm happy. Um, I can shoot just animals too. Uh, this was something that could have never been done in the 1850s, the 1900s when this was the predominant form of photography. Uh, this guy sat right up. Uh, we had to do two shots for this one. The first one, uh, things just didn't work right. Second one, Raven popped right up. Uh, she sat so good. I popped the lights and it worked out well. Uh, I have another little video of the object. This one's fun because I can show you the detail. Um, the process is just photons of light interacting with silver halide and creating structures. Uh, there's no enlargement. There's no pixels. There's no grain. So when you look at these things, they're minute to the detail of the fur. Um, the silver, it creates a structure. So it reflects light in a very unique way. Um, so this is the sun out the window here. And you can see it as, as it starts to hit it. This is really the light passing through that silver halide structure and forming this uh, very unique metallic look. And that's why these exist as objects and they're so cool is when you hold them in your hands, they reflect and change. Um, I think that's just something that you don't get in digital photographs anymore. Um, skip to the next slide. Uh, something as minor as changing a background affects these photos so much. Um, I've lately been shooting on darker backgrounds and you can just see the amount of drama that happens. Uh, I wanted to talk with you all uh, just a bit about what I've learned shooting these things. I've shot hundreds of these portra portraits at this time. Um, lighting is key, whether you're shooting outside um, next to a window or in the studio, light tells the story of the picture. As photographers, I'm sure you all understand this, that light is king. Um, also context, you know, uh, the studio portraits can be limiting in the fact that you don't have a lot of background context and stuff like that. However, there, you can change things just slightly by pulling down a piece of black paper versus white paper and completely change the mood of the portrait. Um, yeah, so again, it's Caitlin uh, and her dog, uh, Maple. <laughs> Um, again, some more dramatic uh, portraits. Uh, same thing. Uh, this was lit with a, you know, a soft key light, a couple hair lights like I have here. Basically, this kind of setup that I'm sitting in uh, and a light on the background to create this nice uh, vignette that you see here. Um, this much uh, harder light. This was also when I was getting started. Uh, I didn't have as much light at my disposal. So this was a bare reflector. <laughs> you know, a foot away from the model. God bless her. She was, <laughs> she handled the big bright flash of the lights. You feel the heat when these lights fire. Um, she did a great job. Again, you see some of these flaws that uh, I didn't quite know how to, to uh, keep at bay when I was first starting. Um, mm. uh, these are some more recent portraits. Uh, this was for a tattoo shop that I did uh, in Petaluma. Um, I shot their whole kind of staff. Uh, again, the, the process fits so many different kinds of people so well. Um, the process only sees UV light. So it doesn't actually see the, the visible spectrum that we see. Um, so it reveals something different about the people than they ever get to see in themselves. Freckles, uh, any uh, little sunspots will really come forward. Uh, because that is the job of that melanin in your skin is to uh, block UV light. The process is only sensitive to UV light. So you can see uh, freckles and stuff show up. Um, our skin is really good at absorbing UV light. That's why we get sunburns and we're prone to skin cancer and these things. Uh, tattoos, like you see here, will fade and almost go away because our skin is absorbing so much of that light. It doesn't reflect and come back. Um, UV glasses, if they're coated, will go dark just like sunglasses. So in that sense, you know, it shows a side of a person 
that they never get to see. Um, it also changes colors. Um, blue, like denim like this, uh, or blue eyes will go very, very white. Uh, anything red that it doesn't see or yellow uh, will go almost completely black. So blueberries will appeal, appear bright white, strawberries will go almost black. Um, these are a couple more of my favorite portraits that I've made. Uh, both of these have something similar about them that I look for and try to uh, control when I make pictures anymore. And that's defining a shape. Um, because there's no cropping involved in the process that I do, each individual image is one of one. I don't get to go back later and decide on a crop. Um, I don't get to change uh, the, I can't brighten them up or darken them down. I have to make the decisions on whether I want an image to be darker or more high key at the time of shooting. Uh, both of these images to me, they have a very nice shape. They have a foundation that then creates a shape out of this negative space. Um, this is what I'm always looking for. This is what makes a portrait sing, in my opinion, is being able to craft a shape like you're creating a landscape. Uh, so yeah, both of these, they have, they're strong at the bottom where they're rooted down here, and then they both taper off and they both utilize this balance of negative space that I think makes them work. Um, very unique, uh, different people. Uh, this is a, a Northern African musician that reached out to me with these traditional uh, Mali robes from about the same uh, time period as the process. Him and his brother came in, uh, sat for this portrait. We made a bunch of the family too. And this one ended up being one of my favorites. Just again, because it has this strong base to it and then it just creates this shape. Um, both of them ended up pretty clean without a lot of flaws. Uh, if I can ever marriage the process, the lighting, the subject, and then create a nice shape and not completely screw it up and have one person too close to the sedge or something, uh, that's when I'm happy with one of these. Um, this is a 11 by 14 clear glass ambrotype. So uh, most of the other pictures that I've showed you besides that first one of the moth have all been done on metal. Um, you can't see through them. This is done on clear glass. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of this. I have this plate. It's not framed. So after we're done, I'll, I'll hold it up and you can kind of see the effect of the clear glass. Uh, this zoomed in uh, feature here shows you the, the real resolution. It's uh, as resolution at a microscopic level. You can put these uh, plates on a microscope and just look in until you see the structure of the silver. Um, the bigger the plate, the more detail and uh, 11 by 14, that's the biggest size that this camera, that the camera behind me can do. Um, uh, the bigger you go, just the more detail that you have. Uh, again, high key picture. Uh, you know, I had my subject Mallory here in, uh, in white. I knew I wanted to shoot her against white. Her blue eyes go very light. Uh, I wanted this to be high key. I don't get to make any of these decisions in post. Uh, you know, I can always digitize the image, change it, but I'm always shooting for the object. Uh, yeah, so I chose, I knew I wanted this one to be bright uh, and it, it all worked out well and it got right there. Um, this is actually a 16 by 20 glass plate negative. So, uh, I, I wanted to include this. This is Alpine Lake Dam. Uh, so you people close to Fairfax have probably been out there. Uh, this was shot in a giant 20 inch camera. I had to set up and point at the dam. Uh, I had an ice fishing tent set up. That's a pop out six by six room as my mobile dark room. While I was doing this, I had a park ranger, uh, very kind show up and ask what I was doing. Uh, if I needed a permit, I said, I'm just making a picture. She looked at my giant 20 inch camera and asked me if there was a smaller digital camera inside of that camera. I said, no, <laughs> she didn't quite understand what I was doing. This camera is bigger than my torso. Uh, didn't ask any questions about the ice fishing tent set up next to it. Told me I was okay to do my thing. And uh, I made this. Um, most of these other images I've showed you have been positives, which mean uh, they're meant to be viewed uh, just as they are. 
by changing the exposure times, development times, and the processing a bit different on clear glass, I can make a negative. Uh, this is a negative image that then I can lay down on a piece of paper, a uh, darkroom paper, and then make a print from. Uh, I haven't gotten a chance to print this one yet. Uh, this is an inverted image of it to show what it would look like uh, once I do print it. Of course, it won't have my hand holding it from the back. And that just kind of shows you the scale of this actual object. Um, back in the 1800s, these were called mammoth plates. Um, there Very, very few people did these. Still to this day, very few people make plates this size. There's probably more people shooting wet plate collodion than there's been in the past 50 years. Um, for a long time, it was just uh, Civil War reenactors and a handful of artists. Fine artists kind of took off and started shooting them more. Um, it's kind of regaining some, uh, some popularity. Uh, but as you go up in size, just because of the difficulty, the costs, uh, the technique, everything gets harder as you scale up. Um, I would estimate there's several thousand people making tintypes today. There's probably 50 or less shooting uh, images that are of this size. Um, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> this was the last time I used that big camera, the big 16 by 20 camera. I took it out to uh, somewhere around Bodega, I think, tried to make a seascape. Uh, there was It was windy, cold, my collodion dried out. It was a full day of shooting and this is all I got. This is a sheet of black glass, expensive, heavy. Um, this will get eventually cleaned off with alcohol and repurposed. Uh, today, that day, all I got was a very stained hands and kind of a, a crummy image. Um, I wanted to include this just because the process is daunting. There's so many little steps, but you know, like like so many things in life, uh, it, it's equally re as rewarding. Um, days like this, you just kind of got to pack it up, uh, you know, put everything away, and just go back. So you know, um, persevere. Uh, that I think is the end of my slideshow. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm kind of most active there. If any of you have that, uh, I share all my work there. You can reach out to me, ask questions there. Uh, I have a website that needs updating, uh, but there's some more work, some of the stuff that you've seen on there. There's a contact form on there and a place where you can book portraits. If you wanna have a portrait, again, family, bring your family, bring your pets in. Uh, give them as gifts. Uh, every, anyone can feel free to email me here too. It's all basically Zane's place in all these different places. Um, email me Zane at Zane's place. Uh, so I'm going to close this up and then I'm going to show you a few examples uh, that I have here in the studio with me. Um, close this. Stop sharing. Okay, so I'm back. Um, this is a good uh, example. So I'm in the studio at Seawood Photo. Again, anybody that's local, this is where I do most of my work. I have a little closet that works as my dark room. Um, anybody that's in the area, come see me anytime. You can see all this stuff that I'm about to show you in person. Uh, this is a good example of a tintype versus an ambrotype. So this is the same image, this little flower I sat in a vase just to kind of test chemistry. Uh, this is on the, the metal. Um, it's a black metal, uh, it looks like a positive image. Same image uh, made right afterwards, shot on clear glass. So the clear glass, you can see right through it. Uh, it's only when it's put on a dark background that it looks like a positive. Um, everything about doing clear glass amber types is harder than shooting on the tintype, the metal. Um, you gotta clean the thing really, really well. Uh, the emulsion doesn't like to stick to the glass. It's see-through, so in the dark room, you forget which side it is. There's lots of little uh, uh, issues with these, but they're ghostly, they're ethereal, and there's just something that's so cool about a well-made clear glass amber type. Um, this one that I showed you in the 
slideshow is one of my favorite clear glass amber types I've ever made. It just worked. Uh, focus landed where I wanted it to be. Again, you can see on a dark background, it appears as this silvery positive. As soon as you remove it from that back background, uh, it becomes virtually see-through. Um, these have to be framed uh, uniquely with a black background. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're incredible to look at in person. So come in, see it. <laughs> this is uh, that negative that I showed you. So this is a 16 by 20 glass plate negative. Um, in the 1800s, the people that were shooting this size um, would carry wagons filled with equipment, hauled by donkeys, giant cameras the size of wagons uh, through the parks uh, to make images this size. Uh, yeah. Eventually, this will get laid down on a piece of photographic paper and contact printed. Um, 90% of the stuff that I showed you uh, today was made in the studio with this camera. Uh, this is the 11 by 14 camera. Um, that's the back. I have an eight by 10 back on it right now. Uh, I use a number of brass lenses uh, all the way from, you know, kind of the golden era of Hollywood all the way back to 1861. Uh, it's a giant brass lens with fingerprints from past photographers on it. Uh, it's one of my most prized possessions. Uh, sometimes to get the, the proper look, uh, the, the old materials and the old equipment is just what makes sense. They work together. Um, I said in my little intro there uh, that I've been so interested in the temporal ambiguity of the process. For me, people love them. They, you know, always talk about how old they look. Um, done properly and done well, uh, to me, they've always looked futuristic as well. They exist in this time where they look old, but also very modern and can be almost holographic. Um, you can shoot on any number of glass or non-organic surfaces. Uh, this is actually, uh, I showed you a tintype version of this in my slideshow. Um, this is made on a, ru a ruby, mirror water glass uh to me this looks like something out of the year 3000 <laughs> when you look at it in person it shimmers and it's silvery and it has all this crazy texture it's the same 175 year old process no different than any of this stuff just done uh in a more contemporary way on a different more unconventional material uh i really want to do more stuff like this in the future uh, bigger, uh, weirder, uh, different shapes and stuff. And yeah, be on the lookout for that stuff, uh, you know. And again, I'm happy to share any of this if you can ever come into the store. Uh, I'm gonna open up to any questions. I know I gave, I gave you a lot of info and threw a lot of stuff at you. So any questions at all, I'm happy I, to answer. I have a question. Um, yes. So I love playing with filters because I don't get into the dark room anymore. Mm -hmm. Does that piss you off that they have filters that are similar? It doesn't. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, uh, you know, some people I think are only familiar with tintypes from the tintype filter. Uh, it was popular at the very early days of like Instagram and cell phone photography. I remember seeing that. Uh, I can always tell the difference. Um, the way they make these filters, and I'm sure it's going to change with AI. But the way they make these filters is uh, it's a defined shape. Uh, these organic analog processes, every time I pour that material onto the plate, it's different. Uh, there's an infinite amount of possibilities on how these things can turn out. I can't ever make the same one twice. Uh, I get asked this all the time, um, managing Seawood and selling you know, analog film cameras. We primarily sell uh, used film cameras, but also deal in digital stuff all the best modern digital stuff as well. I shoot digital cameras. Um, I shoot mirrorless Sony cameras. Uh, I take gigs to get paid for Sony, uh, shooting those. Um, you know, when it makes sense to shoot digital, I do. I shoot a ton of stuff for Seawood, a ton of cameras that we share on 
our social media and in our newsletter every Friday. I shoot a portrait of a camera, always shot with digital. Uh, they're just different tools. Um, I shoot a ton of medium format film, large format film as well, 35 millimeter point and shoot film, uh, phone stuff. It's just, they're all different tools. They all give a different look. I don't discriminate. There's <laughs> definitely some purists out there, uh, elitists maybe in both digital and film world. Uh, I'm always saying it's all just different tools. Um, if using a filter gives you your desired outcome and it serves the presentation that you want, do that, have fun, uh, love it. You know, as long as you're loving what you're doing. Um, there's no way I can make a digital object that is like these handmade objects. So for me, uh, mm -hmm. it's real important to to have that physical thing. After working in all the one hour labs and gift companies and stuff that I've done, I saw a lot of snapshots and a lot of the same imagery over and over. I made a lot of the same prints, you know, as a printer for a long time. I was originally hired at Seawood to do their custom printing. Um, I started, you know, occasionally I see pictures that I love that overwhelm me that are, are beautiful and moving. Um, but just seeing so many images as I have for so long, uh, I, for my personal work, I wanted to do something that was harder and a, a little bit more tangible and felt more special. And these just spoke to me when I first kind of saw my first 10 types of stuff out in the world. I saw little tiny ones because uh, it, it, all the early 10 types you're going to see are never going to be bigger than a five by eight. And those are rare. Um, I saw some people making bigger ones and I was like, I have to do this. I don't know where to go see them. They're not on display anywhere. I want to see what one looks like. So all these things that I've showed you, I've seen very few other examples in person. So it, it's special to me to be able to make something and have them here in the store and share them just that are so unique. So yeah, use filters, uh, use digital, use film, try it all, see what uh, seems like your voice and speaks to you and have fun. I think Jan had a question. Yes, Jan. Jan. Jan wrote, um, he's asking- oh, In the chat. Do he said um no he said no need to protect your skin from the chemistry um the silver nitrate which is the sensitizing agent is corrosive uh that's why it causes these stains to anything organic it's not very corrosive though so it just will stain the outside layer of your skin uh it peels away in a few days um i used to try to keep my hands really clean I still do. I wear gloves during different parts of the process. At some point, you know, I'd heard other wet play photographers say that no wet play photographer is ever going to have clean hands. At some point, I, I I just gave up to it. And, uh, you know, I, I embrace the silver stains. Uh, whenever I meet anybody else that does the stuff that they, they recognize immediately and know what it is. Um, the chemicals, uh, silver nitrate in your eyes would be very, very bad. Uh, it it would uh, probably permanently blind you if enough of it got in there. Um, cool. I'm very, very aware and very cautious when I'm doing certain steps to not allow it to splash or get anywhere near my eyes. I'm very careful not to wipe my eyes. Luckily, I wear these glasses all the time. It helps. Um, ether, uh, which is in the, the emulsion, is very flammable. Uh, it's toxic in long-term durations of exposure uh if i do big stuff like the big 16 by 20 negatives and i have to work in a place where there's not a lot of air i wear a respirator and a ventilator um small uh plates uh i usually pour real quickly cap it off and i'm not exposed to it uh a guy quinn jacobson that works out of uh, uh colorado um i've heard him say that he gets his blood tested regularly for heavy metals in different parts of the chemistry. And he's one of the world's foremost practitioners of it. And he's never come back with anything. Um, so th there's definitely a lot to be cautious about. Um, it can be a dangerous process, but, uh, you know, with enough care, uh, I feel safe doing it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, cautious, uh, definitely, you know, uh, any more, uh, any, 
photographers working uh, with powdered chemistry. Um, a lot more uh, uh, information has come out about the the cancerous nature of like dichromats and some of these early uh, 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 photographic chemistries. Whenever I'm working with anything powder, I'll wear a respirator. And uh, I, I'm very cautious of that because uh, I, I don't think inhaling any uh, of this powder stuff to get in your lungs is a good idea. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely uh, aware of the, the hazards and uh, mindful. And I, I, I recommend everybody is. Who has the next question? I probably have a question. Um, it was interesting how the ambrotype is a uh, negative process the tin type is positive. That's uh, and also putting the ambro type in front of a black uh, background. Uh, what that produces? That's quite interesting to me. Yeah, th this puzzles a lot of people, and it, it took a long time for me to wrap my head around too. Um, so the positive ambro type, where you put it uh, against a black background. Um, really what that is, and even the tin types, they all exist as a thin negative, um, a mm. very, very thin negative when put against a dark surface is going to look like a positive. So yeah. um, yeah. because the silver is bright and reflective. So that's what you're actually seeing in the process that creates the positive and the highlights of the image. And yeah. when I make a negative to print from or like a traditional 35 millimeter negative, you expose it so much more that that silver actually becomes the shadow area. It yeah. builds up the density. So yeah. all these actually exist just as a thin, a thin negative where on a dark surface, they look like a positive. That's very cool. You know, I've noticed even with film, if you look at the emulsion at a certain angle in a certain light, it, you can see a positive. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, so, that, you're seeing the actual silver is sitting on there. Yeah. yeah, and that's the same thing that's happening in my slideshow, that image of the dog that I showed you, where the yeah. light's reflecting, you get to see both the negative and the positive, where you see yeah. the highlight part of the image and the shadow. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thanks. It's a great presentation. Absolutely. Oh, wonderful. I'm so happy that you guys enjoyed it and yeah. uh, that I could show you these things. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, we kind of put together a photo challenge. Do you all want to hear it? Yes. Looking here for it. I will open my thing here and screen share. So <laughs> based on or, or inspired by Zane's work, Take a timeless portrait inspired by the 1850s. Obviously, you can't do a wet plate, but um, or maybe you can mimic one with a with a filter, <laughs> or um, maybe do a little research and check out some old stuff and and get inspired by that. But um, this will be our our March our March photo challenge. Yeah, yeah. And, and tips for editing if you want to get some of that tin type look. Um, the, the process has a pretty narrow tonal range. Um, so you kind of see there, there's a low contrast to it because there's just not as much tonal range available because it's using a small portion of the light spectrum that you get from something like digital. Um, modern digital cameras can have uh, as much as uh, 16 stops of dynamic range, just a huge amount of tones available to it. I've never really thought about it, but I would imagine that its tint types are probably like four, maybe four stops, uh, maybe. Um, so what you're going to do to kind of edit to look like this would be uh, lower your contrast, reel down. Um, you also notice a lot of them have a bit of a, a sepia tone or a warmth. A lot of that comes from the varnish. That last step in the process, I'll varnish them with a, a shellac or a Sandarac varnish, and that protects the silver from oxidizing. Um, that always has a bit of a warm tone to it, and that gives a lot of that warm color that you're seeing. So make a black and white image, bring back in a little warmth, bring the uh, contrast down, and you might get close to one of these old looking images. It'd be great if you could sneak some peeks and make some comments. 
when people yeah. start posting. Yeah, absolutely. Are, are you all going to try and do it? Mm. It's, it's yeah. a tough assignment, but I'll give it a try. Try it. I'm good. Well, I think that it's interesting because it um, it requires some research into what looks what eighteen fifties photos look like. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. And I would say more so too. You know, if you can't get that look or don't care to get that look, I think one of the takeaways that I think could be valuable is just to appreciate the intentionality of it. Um, it's a laborious process using a big old camera. Everything's slow. I can't crop. I can't change the lighting after the fact. So, you know, maybe just go out and try to take an image that uh, is very intentional. Slow down. Uh, don't shoot for the crop. Make sure you look at your edges very carefully. Just take a step forward, move back, get low, get high. Look at the edges of the photograph and then try to shoot one frame, you know. Um, instead of uh, it's so easy anymore the digital or even with film to to bracket and shoot a bunch and you know shoot from here there crop in edit a lot maybe just try to shoot a frame without doing any of that make that sure you try to get one perfect uh without doing anything uh, that would have been a great challenge too i didn't think of that yeah. same thing <laughs> just shoot if, I, if i could interject one thing you just mentioned about the edges of a photo I learned in a photo class to be very aware of what goes on. The corners and the edges of a photo can really distract. So you got to be really aware of what's going on in your photo. So pre-plan things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm constantly obsessing over the edges. Uh, you'll notice little shapes and stuff that get close to the edge of the, the photograph. They can create these tangents and like things where they're cut off and be very distracting. Uh, anything that's closer to the edge of a photo too is gonna hold weight. So like a couple of those portraits where I was talking about the big base at the bottom, uh, you wanna be deliberate with that. So you have like a little object, like a square or something off to the edge of a photo, people are gonna look at it. Your eye is gonna go there if all the edges are clean. So I'm always double checking, even when I shoot digital anymore. Oh, do I want this there? Do I want maybe if I just move forward a little bit, it will clean up the edges. Well, in 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 my in my art school training, uh, the philosophy was cropping is evil. <laughs> that the photographer should be responsible for every centimeter, every square centimeter of the photo. Now, with that said, I often crop my photos, yeah. but whenever I do it means I did not see properly. You know, and journalists have to uh, be very aware of that. They can't do much cropping or alterations of the photos. So I think photojournalism is quite honest in, in this approach. I'm, I have to run. Thank you, Zane. Appreciate it. I'll see you at Seawood. You're very welcome. I look forward to seeing you. Pictures are beautiful. Yeah, I agree. Definitely unique. Thank you. I re I really appreciate it. Yeah. I love the the one with the woman with the the blue eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll You're have very... a video for you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank <laughs> well, you. It was very thank nice to meet everybody, everybody, and uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, yeah, have a lot of fun out there making photos. If you're ever in our area, come see me at Seawood anytime. I'm always here. <laughs> Thank you, Zane. Take Bye, care. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Bye, Mallory. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Bye, Take care. Bye.